Ready? Ready? Oh, yeah. oh, if we use. Good evening, my name is Diane Vu and I would like to welcome everyone to this virtual community briefing hosted by County Executive Mark Elrich. The purpose of tonight's event is for you to hear directly from the County Executive and other county leaders as they answer questions that we have received from residents, parents, businesses, nonprofits, and community groups. The questions we are answering tonight have come from people like you who have reached out to us through social media, MC311, as well as through emails and phone calls. Of course, there is no way that we can answer every question in just 90 minutes. The idea for today is for us to address the most frequently asked questions that we have received. After today's program, we will post the questions and the answers on our website for your reference. We also want to remind viewers that this discussion is being broadcasted live on <coughs> Facebook, YouTube, and cast on County Cable Montgomery Channel 6, on Comcast and RCN, HD on 996 and 1056, and Channel 30 on Verizon and the MCPS website. <laughs> Immediately following the live broadcast, you can view the recording on Facebook and on YouTube. We also want you to know that this is not your only opportunity to get information from us. Over the next few weeks, we will be hosting additional conversations to keep you informed. We encourage you to stay connected and up to date by following us on Facebook, Twitter, and the county's website. I want to start by introducing our speakers for tonight. They will provide a brief opening statement or update, and then we will get right into the questions. First, we have our host, County Executive Mark Elrich. Thank you. He is joined by County Health Officer, Dr. Travis Gales, Montgomery County Public Schools Superintendent, Dr. Jack Smith, and Director of Office Emergency Management, Dr. Earl Stoddard. I want to thank you all for being here. So let's get started. County Executive Elridge, would you like to provide us with some opening remarks? Yeah, um, I guess my first comment is, these are the kind of press conferences you really hate doing. Um, this is not a fun reason for getting together and uh, we're dealing with a crisis that I think everybody is well aware of. I, I wanna thank everyone who's joining us virtually um, both in real time and people who will be watching this later. And I just want to begin by acknowledging where we, on, where we are in this moment. I mean, it's pretty clear our world's been turned upside down. Um, I am old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, there is nothing like this in my life. And I don't think there's anything like this in most people's lives. And it's, uh, it is really staggering how rapidly and dramatically the world can change. Um, We've got businesses that are closed. We've got schools that are closed. We've got classes going online. We have large scale job losses. Um, just an astounding vanishing of jobs in both in the county and in the country. And uh, we have businesses with cash flow fears. We have residents with cash flow fears. Everybody's worried about if I'm not working or my business is closed, how am I gonna pay the rent? How am I gonna pay the bills? Because those things keep coming and uh, how do I do that when I'm not working? And hopefully we'll have some answers to some of that later. Um, and then there are the health fears, which cannot be minimized. Um, we are in a situation where, because of the utter lack of testing, the fact that the government did not prepare at all, did not heed early warning signs, left us in a situation where we can't even do fundamental basic testing that would have made managing this crisis um, and giving us high, better levels of certainty about what it all means. We are struggling to deal with that because of the lack of information um, that comes out of not having these test kits. So I know for a lot of people this is overwhelming and frightening and I want to urge everybody to stay calm and focus on what we can do. One of the things that I've been trying to get across to people is that we have to go forward. This virus will end. It will end. When it ends, 
we've got a county to run, and we've got a society to go back and bring back to functioning. And our job isn't just to look at how we manage this crisis and make sure that the epidemic goes away. We need to make sure that the county, when we emerge from this, when the businesses emerge from this, that we're able to get back where we need to be on the track to the place that we all want to go. And so my, my view in this and my work in this is both to manage the immediate, but also to begin looking down the road at what we need to do to make sure that we emerge from this in the wholest way that we possibly can. So tonight I'm going to try to answer some of your questions and, um, and other people will be up here adding, you know, adding to this discussion. I'm not the person who runs the schools. I am not the chief health officer or the emergency officer. And we have really talented, skilled people who are going to add to this discussion. So basically, I just want to talk to you about guidelines. Stay in as much as possible. Um, we are late to doing this as a country. We're a little bit late in Maryland, but late is better than never, and it's absolutely important to maintain distance. When we go out, we're talking about physical distancing. Social distancing, I think, is an, was an unfortunate misnomer because it sort of implies that you shouldn't be, you should be distant from people socially. What you need to do is be distant from people physically. So we encourage people to use Zoom and all the other media for talking to people. Um, this is much better than when I was growing up when the only thing you had was a phone. Now you can actually talk to each other, have a drink with each other, and do all the things we normally want to do, uh, but you just have to do it over, over video. Wash your hands well and often. Don't touch your face when you're out and touch them as little as possible. If you feel sick, self-quarantine. And I'll add that I, if, I don't know if the CDC has done it yet, but I believe you know, they're going to move toward recommending that people wear cloth masks Cloth masks, masks aren't meant to protect you. They are meant to minimize the spray of the virus that potentially comes out of an infected person's mouth. And since we don't know who's infected, anything you can do to minimize what might come from your mouth is a good thing to do. And Dr. Gales will be giving you more de details about our actions. But our actions are going to determine how long this is and how bad this is. This is one time in your life when you can be absolutely certain that what you do as a person, what we do as a people, is going to determine the outcome of this virus and the epidemic. If we do things right, we'll be able to minimize a very bad situation. And if we don't do things right, then we only have to look around us and the rest of the world to see what happens when we ignore the warnings and ignore the advice of people who are trying to keep us safe. So I just encourage everybody, do what you can do, make sure you do the things that matter um, that we've talked about that can help keep everybody safe. And um, I'll just say that, you know, Dr. Gale is going to talk some more about the basic testing and all the health-related issues. Dr. Stoddard is going to discuss our logistical operations, and Dr. Smith is going to discuss the school operations. Uh, I want everybody to know this will not be the only community briefing. There will be more. Uh, we'll have this briefing translated so that it's available to other languages, and that will be worked on beginning tomorrow so we can get this out as soon as possible to everybody. Um, we kind of rushed to get this put together, so all the things we would have liked uh, we weren't able to do. Simultaneous translation would have meant it would have been very difficult to get a lot done in an hour or so. When this comes out in other languages, people will get to, I think, the benefit of a fuller discussion that, we, that we'll be able to have by having more time dedicated to answering questions. I want to acknowledge all the people in the county government who are working so hard to keep the county functioning. We will talk later about, yes, the county is still open and working. And I want to thank our first responders and our firefighters. They, they are out there doing their job every day. We all know that they're you know, often in closer encounters than we ever recommend people to be in. We've got our bus drivers and our social workers and our corrections officers who are all out there. If there's a child protective service is services issue, our people are going out. If there's a domestic violence issue, our people are going out. So a lot of people in the county government still continuing to do their work. We've got people in offices taking applications for food assistance, rental assistance, and any other help we can continue to give people. So the county is up and running to the degree that we can. We've got many, many people at home doing teleworking. We're doing everything we can to minimize 
the impact of reduction of services on our county residents and everything we can do to make sure that our workers and you are safe. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Elwich. I appreciate the opportunity to join you here tonight and uh, talk about our community and our school system. First, I'd like to just say thank you to Mr. Elwich and the county administration, to the county council, and a very, very sincere appreciation to Dr. Stoddard and Dr. Gales. Dr. Gales has been in constant communication with the school system, and we very, very much appreciated the collaborative way that everyone has worked together on behalf of the residents and especially in my world, the children and adolescents of this community. The school system too is up and running. It's running in a very different way. And you know this and it's obvious, but I'm gonna say it anyway. This is not regular school that we are attempting to stand up. And while many people experience the digital world every day through their children, we don't have pre-K through 12 digital platforms for every discipline, every subject area, and every grade level. But we're standing those up and our 24,000 employees have come together and they have done some amazing things already. Now remember when Dr. Salmon announced the closure on March 12th, I was sitting here in this building with the county executive. She said we were having an emergency closure just like a snowstorm. And that means that our school-based people don't work during that time. And then she said, and you need to plan to make up these days using spring break. Well, all of that continues to evolve. But everybody came back together, all of the year-round employees, all the school-based folks this past Monday, and we have begun to set up all the work we did in the past several weeks and in the past two weeks around this. So we just ask everyone to work together, and we know this is a profound, profoundly uh, difficult situation for parents. We understand that. In fact, many, many of our 24,000 employees are parents, and they're experiencing this every day, both as a parent and as a professional. And so uh, we are, uh, no one's choosing to be in this situation, but we are pulling together to make sure we continue providing learning experiences, learning opportunities for the students we serve. In fact, I'll just share some numbers with you. This morning, we had about 2,500 Zoom classes going on. This afternoon, uh, well over 1,000 more, and those will continue to ramp up as well as pushing out information, contacting our students and families, and we continue to serve about 40,000 meals each day, as well as move out equipment, both connect for connectivity and for uh, digital resources like Chromebooks across the, the county. So we are very, very pressed by this, all of us together, but we're also very fortunate to be the community we are, and we really appreciate how everyone's come together to support learning students and schools in Montgomery County. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Um, Dr. Gales, would you like to provide us with some opening remarks? Sure, good evening to those at home. And first I want to say thank you to all of the folks who have been working hard, uh, as, as County Executive Elridge pointed out, um, on the front lines uh, from our healthcare workers, our first line responders, to folks in grocery stores, providing services across the board. Um, thank you for your service and thank you for your continued efforts in keeping us safe. Four weeks ago, we received notification that we had our first case or first resident of the state of Maryland in, in Montgomery County who tested positive for COVID-19. Over the last four weeks, those numbers have increased, both from a state perspective, we now have over 3,000 cases, and we have over 400 cases in Montgomery County, or 400 persons who've tested positive with COVID-19. Now, what has not changed, though, is what we have talked about consistently from that very first set of interviews and press conference four weeks ago to now. We talked about the need to practice good hand hygiene, socially distance as that has, has moved forward in terms of policies um, and made sure that folks understand that the majority of cases have had a mild to moderate symptom uh, forecast and we, that the data has held true. But what we have noticed is that this has impacted age, across the age spectrum. Our youngest case reported today was three months old, a Montgomery County resident, to those who are in their upper 80s and 90s. We have seen the impact where we have seen fatalities, again, across the age spectrum, uh, with six residents in Montgomery County and 36 residents across the state. 20% of those who have tested positive for COVID-19 have required hospitalization. Uh, but again, want to emphasize that the overwhelming majority of cases have had mild to moderate symptoms. 
Now, we put in lots of policies to be able to mitigate the spread of transmission, and we want to emphasize and continue through the conversation today to emphasize the value of those practices, staying at home and sheltering in place as much as possible, minimizing exposure in public to others to mitigate transmission, continuing to wash those hands, as well as practicing social distancing principles when coming out into public, whether that's through exercise and walking, going to work, having press conferences such as where we are right now, spaced apart, um, or conti continuing to operate in your daily spectrum and scope of life. So we'll have a host of questions to talk in more detail about some of the health aspects, but I encourage you to remember all of the things that we've talked about, hold to those principles, and continue to practice those protocols that we've put into place. Great, thank you, Dr. Gales. Dr. Stoddard. Thank you. Uh, I want to echo many of the things that Dr. Gales said in thanking our responders, our private sector partners, people working in grocery stores and other places. This is a whole of community response. Uh, we're up here talking to you, but really everyone you know, on the other side of the camera looking at us today has as much to play a role in this event as we do up here, and that's really important to understand. So we began responding to this event in January, it, in taking preparatory actions, and, and those evolved in February into March, and now we're in April. Um, our, several of our key tenants I want to talk about are uh, protecting our residents, protecting our employees, and still delivering, as the county executive alluded to, the services that our residents rely on. Those three things guide how we operate every day, and we talk every day with our partners to try and ensure that we can do all three of those things well. There are several areas I want to give some updates in and, and talk because I know we've put out a lot of information through press and other sources to make sure that um, we keep our community well informed, but I want to talk on several points. Uh, there's a lot of conversation you're going to hear about personal protective equipment. I think the county executive and Dr. Gales have talked about it. Uh, right now, we're looking, we have in Montgomery County roughly two to three weeks worth of personal protective equipment for our response partners. We are working every day to acquire more resources through several avenues. First, we have traditional and non-traditional vendors that we try and acquire resources from. We have the state partners, we have our federal partners who provide us some level of resources. We have begun receiving donations, and I think many of you may have seen today where we actually put out some things soliciting some donations for personal protective equipment. You can, you can certainly make those donations. We are also looking to buy from our closed non-essential businesses. And so we're, we're working through all those avenues to try and acquire resources. Another really good example of things that we've done locally to try and get more protective equipment is partnerships with our local businesses. I think the most obvious case is where we've actually partnered with our distilleries to produce things like hand sanitizer. Um, and also we're working with two local companies that produce uh, cloth, cloth and actually can help us produce masks. And so we're working collectively across the board to try and increase the amount of resources that we have in Montgomery County to protect our responders, but also in turn protect our uh, nonprofit community uh, and our residents. In addition, uh, we've also received a lot of volunteer, uh, volunteerism opportunities that have come up. Our volunteer center has uh, you know, established a, a COVID specific website where people can actually register opportunities and uh, requests for resources. Through our mail-in response program, we actually have over 1,800 uh, recruited volunteers who range from physicians, nurses, uh, pharmacists, and other uh, clinical expertise that we will utilize to address the surge capacity issues that Dr. Gales alluded to. Our, our CERT team, our community emergency response team underneath our fire department has been activated in supporting donations management, and we've activated a food access task force aimed at identifying all the, the challenges that we face in our food service delivery to our to our public uh, and, and make sure that we can ramp those activities up to uh, account for the increased need that we see because of the economic interruption. So we're trying to do all those things and many, many, many more that I could highlight, but we're also trying to make sure that we do them in a manner that can be consistently voiced to a whole host of, of our county residents. We established a, a team focused on our special populations. That is those with limited English proficiency, uh, those with hearing or visual impairments, our seniors, uh, those with vulnerable health conditions. We want to make sure that we're focusing our message not just to the public that is on social media every day, but also to the public that may be harder to reach in certain circumstances. So we've partnered, to, we've, we've developed a translation team who does six languages of translation for, for all of our written materials as well as state and federal materials. Uh, we're, we're partnering with our uh, faith community, our nonprofits, our service delivery uh, professionals to make sure that we can provide as much reach out into the community. 
we know we can do better and we'll continue to do better as we learn throughout this process, but it's really important to us that we're reaching all of our community residents. And finally, I want to talk about another vulnerable population, our homeless shelters. You will see uh, actually today two additional shelter locations lo opened up in Montgomery County. Our goal is to make sure that we can provide social distancing for our homeless population as well. We know that they're a particularly vulnerable population. That's an area of focus that we've had to make sure that they're protected. Uh, they're in a congregate living, living uh, environment, and it's really important that we make sure that they stay safe. And so with that, I think that I'll conclude. Great, thank you. Um, so as a colleague and also a county resident, um, I thank all of you for your remarks and for your leadership. Um, so let's go to our very first question. And I'm gonna start with Dr. Gales because we've received so many questions about testing. So Dr. Gales, the big question that so many people wanna know is about testing. Where can they get a test? Why aren't there more tests? And when will there be more testing facilities uh, be opening in the county like there are in Prince George's County? Sure, so take a step back and explain why testing is important. So the three core fundamentals of pandemic response are contingent upon early testing, early quarantining, and early access to treatment interventions that are helpful to diminishing the symptoms related to a disease. So in this, this perspective, testing, early testing would be important because we could identify cases earlier so that we could get people quarantined and isolated at a quicker time, again, diminishing their time that they have to come into contact with others and, and, and spreading transmission. So that's why testing is important and why it's such an, uh, it's emphasized in so many places. What has, what has been happening is that early on in the process, testing was tied solely to travel history. And that missed an opportunity to get a true understanding of the burden of disease in the community for individuals who had not traveled or had not come into contact with someone else. And so as that evolved, we still weren't testing or made, testing was not made available to individuals who didn't fit that travel criteria. After that was changed and we recognized that community transmission was indeed happening in the country, we still don't have a great volume and access points for many people to access, access testing outside of their private provider network or the emergency room. We have been working to establish opportunities that are outside of the emergency room or outside of the traditional provider network for individuals to be able to access such as mobile testing sites. Now the state has stood up a couple, three actually mobile testing sites and other jurisdictions utilizing their vehicle emissions programs. We have been working with the state to establish that here in Montgomery County and hope to be able to announce in the very near future um, opportunities that have resulted from those conversations. Uh, and as your, to your quest, the last part of your question, um, why don't we have venues such as those in, in Prince George's County? So I wanna make sure that people understand also where tests come from. So there's a supply that comes from the federal government that's applied to states that have been utilized for priority populations, such as those who are hospitalized in nursing homes, our healthcare providers who've been exposed and first responders who've been exposed, and individuals who are symptomatic and don't have another diagnosis that could define what, what their symptoms are. Uh, and the other kits come from, or tests come from private laboratories that providers can order on their own through visiting them in their private primary care offices or in urgent care spaces. Uh, and so what we have been trying to do is to pull together a combination of those resources to be able to offer alternative venues and sites for folks so that they can get tested. I will emphasize though that in any of those situations that you've seen in other jurisdictions, they are still tied to individuals who are symptomatic and who have seen a provider and are receiving a referral. Testing is not on a first come first serve basis or a demand only basis. And to, back to the Prince George's example, the Prince George's testing site at FedEx Field is an example of a partnership with the National Guard and the state uh, utilizing that venue, certainly in partnership with the Prince George's Health Department, but utilizing that venue that is open to anyone regardless of your home jurisdiction to utilize. I want, I want to amplify on the, on the availability of test kits because I, I think people are baffled mm -hmm. about why you can't get this. So when the state first announced that they were going to open up um, five testing sites and using the vehicle emission stations, 
there was a long delay before they did anything. And so a number of us were pushing about why they were delaying. And they said they only had 500 test kits for the state of Maryland. That's pretty stunning. And they said, if we open up the five centers, those kits will be gone in an hour to two hours, and there's not going to be another 500 kits coming in tomorrow. And they still need kits for all the cases that Travis was talking about. I talked to one of the hospital administrators that up until last week, they had to send their tests away. They were taking four to five days to get results back to them. And they couldn't run the tests because they didn't have the reagents they needed. So first they couldn't get test kits. When they could get test kits, they couldn't get the reagents. So there's just been a dearth of supply. And this isn't a phenomena here. This is a true in New York, on the West Coast, California, everywhere. The supply has not been there. And I will say, you know, the, one of the biggest mistakes I think the federal government made was not identifying the rapid tests early in the companies that had them and not mandating that both those companies make their formulas available to other companies and that other countries that have other companies that have machinery to produce this be directed to produce this. We lost an opportunity to get test kits out early. Um, they're going to come, but we're going to hit a surge here before they come. Great. Thank you. Um both to the both of you for clarification on the testing because that is one of the biggest questions that we've been receiving is around that. Um, so right under testing, um, we've received a lot of questions about the schools, Dr. Smith. And so I'm going to ask you, um, how is at-home instruction going to work and when will it start? I am particularly concerned about students who don't have computer or access to an internet. Can you give me more information? Sure, thank you. Uh, so we too are concerned about students who don't have computers and access, and I'll talk about that as part of this overall answer. But uh, we spent, as I said, the, the last several weeks, and in particular the previous two weeks, creating a system where we can reach students through a variety of different methodologies. So we can use synchronous Zoom and where we're you know, live and that we're, we're working with that. We're using a asynchronous systems where the teacher puts in information or a video and the student then sees it at a later time. We're using video and television, telephone calls, and we actually have a, we're standing up a system right now where uh, MCPS staff can call a number uh, and it goes through that number to the student's home if they have to use, since they have to use their personal cell phone, and then it shows the system number at the family's house. And all of these things have been uh, under the last three weeks. We started this past Monday with our full staff back in full force and began standing up professional learning opportunities for teachers and support professionals and administrators. And uh, as I said yesterday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, teachers and others started connecting with students in these different ways. By yesterday, some classes were up and running, and our goal is, to, is this first phase is to connect and move these things out. Right now, we're completing quarter marking period three, quarter three. So right after the holiday weekend, we'll finalize all of the grades for marking period three, and then we'll start marking period four. And we'll talk about grades, I know, later, so I'll hold that but uh, our teachers are just doing some amazing things. I've already seen some examples and we'll be putting out some examples of that this weekend in a video like this one so that people can actually see what's happening for children. And um, we'll just continue to do this until we can reoccupy our school buildings, which is what we all hope will happen before the end of this year. Uh, the governor's order goes till April 24th, but we'll continue doing this and continue building it out every day until this is over or until the end of the year and we've already started talking about what can we do this summer to support children and families that need this uh, service this summer in a greater, bigger way than we have typically during the year. So a lot of, of different kinds of work being done to both respond and as our, our colleagues in emergency services say, to mitigate the negative effects and to plan how to recover from this. And so all of that's going on right now. Great, thank you. Um, and I know one of the biggest concerns about students being at home and home instruction is meals. Mm -hmm. So MCPS has served a lot of meals over the last few weeks. 
Um, can you uh, tell us more about that? Will the service continue and will it be expanded? And also, how are workers who are distributing the meals being protected? Well, the protection of the workers who are doing that service on the, the front lines, if you will, is so important to us. So we are communicating with our colleagues across the table over here all the time about that and how we make sure that they are uh, safe and that they're not uh, putting themselves at risk and simultaneously that they're not spreading. Because we forget, I like to think that I can get the virus from somebody else, but it, I also have to realize I can give the virus to somebody else. And, and so we all have to be really aware of that. And so we'll continue the meal service. We put in more protocols. And as I said, uh, Dr. Stoddard and Dr. Gales have been tremendous partners with us in providing their expertise on how to keep people safe. We'll keep doing the meals, just as an example. The first day, Monday, the 13th, 4th, to 16th, uh, we served 2,400 meals that day. Last Friday, we served 62,000. We're hitting in the 40,000s every day. Wow. And when we realize we have 55,000 plus children who received free and reduced meal service, that's probably still not meeting the need that's out there for many of our students. Wow, that's incredible. Thank you, Dr. Smith. We've actually partnered in a lot of ways too. We've yes. actually made sure that the, the ride on the ride on bus system continued to access those feeding locations because we knew that was an important essential service that we wanted to uh, maintain. So we've been coordinating with the school system to make sure if, if they're going to add sites that we're prepared on the county side with our transportation assets to uh, to provide those services as well. And so you know we, we've partnered and you know they've asked for tents and things like that to make sure this this operates more smoothly for the workers. We want to make sure that we're partnering with them. It's really important to us that, you know, uh, this is going to have an impact on all of our children, and we want to make sure that we can mitigate and minimize that to the extent that we can by providing some sense of normalcy through education and things like that. That's right, and I should give a shout out to the nonprofits who are also partnering for weekend backpacks with meals in those and many other ways, and we'll continue to find where this service is needed. We're in about 40 some sites right now, but we'll continue to watch that and how things shift for our residents. Okay, great. Uh, so Dr. Starter, um, speaking of uh, safety and keeping people safe, um, there have been a number of reports about public safety and first responders testing positive for COVID-19. What is the county doing to protect them and us from being infected? Sure, so I mean, obviously the, the biggest thing is when they detect any sort of symptoms, they obviously are, are go to our occupational medical services, uh, get flagged and pulled off of service. And we do, we work with Dr. Gales and his team to do a contact investigation for anyone who might've interacted with them when they became ill, uh, you know, during the entire course of their business. And then we get those people potentially quarantined. There are a number of people quarantined based on their exposures to, uh, based, basically expo based on their public safety exposures and they're basically self-monitoring at their homes. Obviously, our first responders are a critical part of our, our, our strategy to beat this virus. We make sure that they have uh, personal protective equipment. All of our EMS providers for every EMS call are wearing at least a surgical mask and gloves to every encounter. And then because we've done 911 center screening of calls, we can actually flag which calls represent potentially higher risk encounters. And in those cases, they will actually wear the more protective respirator mask to make sure that they are, you know, number one, not exposing anyone that, you know, if they were to have an asymptomatic case, but also not being exposed by that encounter as well. And so we are making sure that we have personal protective equipment. They, the first responders are our, our most critical asset because we're going to need them to treat the people who get ill. And um, we're trying to make sure that they have the equipment, the training, the fit testing that you need to wear a respirator, all of those things to be, be kept safe. And obviously, as if, if they get exposed, we pull them back and make sure that they are safe and well. Um, that's a big part of this. We wanna make sure that you know, they're putting their lives in danger by helping all of us. And we wanna make sure that we're treating them uh, fairly and, and, and safely to keep them health, healthy too. I just wanted to add one thing to uh, Dr. Stoddard's comment. He mentioned the concept of contact evaluation and investigation, and I know that may cause some concern at home. So what does that mean exactly? 
So as he alluded to, if someone has been exposed or tested positive, what we do is in disease control as part of the team, we'll call and do an investigation, including an in-depth interview with that individual to assess who they've come into contact with, try to get an understanding of when their symptoms started to determine when they may have been infectious and contagious. Uh, and then based upon those interviews and conversations, that determines the scope of other individuals that we talk to and provide guidance in terms of whether or not they need to quarantine at home and follow their symptoms versus they're not considered to be at risk. And so when you hear in news stories about cases becoming, uh, re being reported that they are positive and we say that others aren't at risk, that is the result of an in-depth investigation and folks who have expertise in this area determining the level of risk that others may have come, uh, others may have based upon their contact that they've come into, uh, they've had with the individual. Thank you, Dr. Gale. So speaking of testing, Um, so speaking of testing, uh, one of the questions that we've received is why is the county withholding information about people who test positive? Why can't you tell us generally where they live in the county? And we need to know, so we need to protect ourselves. So why are you not providing that information okay. to us? Well, first and foremost, we are very transparent and provide lots of information, relevant information to the public. Uh, and those who are conducting the investigations to determine the level of safety and provide guidelines for those at home do have access to that information. We have, a, have to walk a very precarious line in terms of balancing the privacy of individuals who are impacted and our cases with the information that we share with the public. So I can affirm to you that the information that we do receive and we do have access to, we are using that to guide our principles and the recommendations that we are providing to the general public. We aren't hiding anything. We are using that information to inform our processes, but we are also respecting the privacy of the individuals who have been impacted by the disease. Now we continue to look at the data and look at ways that we can share data, uh, again, to help inform the public. Uh, when we have had cases, we have tried to, uh, we've moved away from providing one-on-one -on -one examples since the cases have increased significantly, but we are providing information in terms of the percentage by gender, percentage by age, uh, and hopefully we will get to the point where we can share more information about geographic distribution. We look at these, inf this information and we look at this data to assess whether or not we have a cluster, a cluster meaning a large set of cases tied to a particular geography, a space, a location, or a particular event. We've not seen any evidence based upon that so far in the cases. Now, we have been very transparent when we have seen a venue for example, a nursing home associated with an exposure uh, with a particular number of cases. So we recognize the anxiety at home. We recognize the concerns that folks have at home, but I wanna be clear that we're not withholding information. We are providing as much information as we can to the public, again, being transparent, while protecting privacy, but rest assured that the whole comprehensive nature of all of the different facts and data are being used to drive the principles and guidelines that we're putting to the public. I would also add that, and I heard this from Dr. Gales earlier today, so I think that I'll, I'll echo what he said. Because of some of the challenges with testing, even the cases that we know about may not represent the full burden of, of illness within our community, and therefore, uh, if we were simply to provide the locations where Kate, we, know, we know we have cases, that may actually provide a false sense of security that there aren't cases in other places. And that is entirely a possibility that is out there. And so that's why we're giving this general recommendation about good hand hygiene, uh, social distancing, and other things, because we can't know in all cases the full number of people who may have been exposed to the disease or, or who may have the disease right now. And therefore, we have to just make sure that every encounter that we have with people outside of our direct immediate mm -hmm. family is done in a manner that's fully consistent with good social distancing and hand hygiene practices. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, so County Executive Elrich, um, on Monday, the governor had a press conference about the stay at home executive order. After that, uh, our 311 call center um, and many of our emails were flooded with <coughs> questions. People were very confused about the stay at home order. 
So um, can you clarify where can people go and what happens when they go out during the stay at home order? Will the police stop them? If they work for an essential business, can they still go to work? And what is an essential business? Um, all very good questions. The, um, the governor gave um, his executive order on Monday. I've absolutely thought it was the right thing to do. I, I did a press conference about a week earlier, um, and I had said at that time that I thought we were one step away from this and that it was going to be determined on, on the number of cases and the growth of cases and whether or not people followed the social distancing advice. And people didn't follow the social distancing advice. I mean, we watched kids in playgrounds and playing on the pay, play equipment after trying to tell people, please don't have the children playing on the play equipment. Um, you routinely saw people gathering. So the governor turned what had been a request into an executive order. And what it means is if you don't have, if you're not working in an essential business, um, a government entity that where you have to be there. Um, we've, for example, here we've teleworked a lot of people, and some people just are home because we'd, rather than bring them in here and have them work, if this was the only place they could work, we decided it was safer to keep them home. Um, the grocery stores are open, the pharmacies are open. If you need um, materials for repairing your house, this does not mean going in and buying paint because you think this is a good time to paint your house. But if you think you, that you need something for an electrical switch or something that you need a supply at, you can go out and get those supplies. You can still carry out from restaurants and you can pick up from essential, essential businesses, but you can, can no longer um, have a face-to-face -face, um, transaction. It has to be curbside. Um, as I read the guidelines that uh, that, have, that came out to clarify his original order. Um, so essential businesses are basically goods and services that you really need. There are a bunch of tech companies that provide essential services, whether it's cybersecurity or they're running experiments and they've got equipment that requires maintenance. Um, people can come in and maintain the equipment and make sure the experiments are still running, which requires a much reduced workforce. Um, that's sort of the universe and the governor expects us to stay home he was very clear no bus riding no subway riding unless you're on your way to pick up something from a critical business essential business and or if you're going to work at an essential business so basically he wants everybody to stay home uh, you can walk in the park but you can't gather in the park um, the parks department is finally beginning to put fences around the equipment so that people aren't tempted and children in particular aren't tempted to go over and play on the equipment. That's a good thing. But it's great to be able to keep our parks open. And so we want to, we want to be able to demonstrate that people are observing social distancing, physical distancing in the parks because if the state were to conclude that's not happening, they will close the parks. So, so we all have an interest in keeping the park open. It's the nicest place to walk. Um, I guess that's kind of the breadth of it. Do you think of anything else to it? Feel free. I, I, would, I would add one thing that the, the order is not, the enforcement of the order is not, is you're not going to see checkpoints with police officers pulling people over with the express purpose <coughs> of checking whether they've got a badge or an idea of where they're going. What law enforcement is going to do is in the course of their normal business, so if there was an automobile accident or there was they pulled over someone for speeding, they may ask questions about what, what essential business or activity they were going to do in that particular uh, instance. Uh, they're also going to much more rigorously enforce the gathering bans and the, and the orders against gatherings, parties, uh, playing on equipment. They're going to be much more aggressive about that uh, enforcement than they were before Monday. But the, re the reality is most businesses that were, were, were closed before the order took place on Monday are the <coughs> same businesses who are going to be closed after, with a few exceptions about curbside. But really what it is, is it's a statement of the enforcement that will go into it that really changed from the governor's order on, on Monday. That's a really key thing yeah. to say. Um, it should not change whether you go seek medical care. It should not change whether you're going to the grocery store or a pharmacy. 
You should still be doing it in the socially distancing, safe way that you were doing it before Monday, after Monday. But obviously, you know, you may, you may in the course of, you know, law enforcement going out and doing their normal business, be asked about where you're going. Um, again, it's not going to be checkpoints. It's not going to be stops. Um, but they'll ask questions, and in most cases, if you provide a reasonable answer, you'll be a lot. You're just going to go about your business. Dr. Stoddard, I think I should just say that we really need our students to not congregate on school grounds, in parks, on play fields. You know, large groups of students playing a, a soccer game, those sorts of things, because. As the medical professionals and the emergency professionals have said, you're not only putting yourself at risk, you're putting those you love and care about in your home at risk, your best friend at risk, and people you don't even know at risk. So we just really ask, and the vast majority of MCPS students have absolutely done what we've asked them to do. So anyone who's tempted, please don't give in to that temptation. So Dr. Stard, back to the um, enforcement piece. There are mentions of a letter. Um, can you talk a little bit more about this letter? Is it mandatory? What needs to be on the letter? Sure, so what, this is actually comes from the Office of Legal Counsel from the governor's office. And what it essentially says is, uh, employers may wish to provide their employees with a letter that states the name of the employee, uh, the essential role that your business plays, what that employee does to support that essential business, and then the signature of the employer. Those letters are not mandatory. Obviously, if you're going to the grocery store, you're not going to have a letter like that. Uh, but it's really meant to give some added assurance to the employee that they can go about their business, of the, you know, do the essential business's work, while feeling the security of, that they themselves are not going to engage with law enforcement and face a, you know, a citation or a, a, some other issue from their work. It's not a requirement, it is a recommendation of employers that they provide this letter explaining why that employee is an essential, supports an essential service. Thank you, so on the thread of documentation, another question that we received is um, concerns of people who may be undocumented, um, but not just undocumented people. I mean, I am a citizen and I don't carry around my proof of citizenship on me. So people are concerned that if they're stopped by police and they're undocumented, how can they prove that they are um, uh, uh, in compliance with the governor's order? Does the letter need to address this? Should I be worried if I don't have proof of my residency or if I don't have papers at all? I'm certain the county executive is going to want to say something on this, but, <laughs> yeah. but I, I think, you know, we, I've spoken to Chief Jones. He was ex extremely explicit both to me and down to the officers. This change, the governor's order, does not in any way change the way that Montgomery County operates as far as immigration status. We do not consider it in the conduct of our law enforcement business, uh, and we are not going to consider it, uh, you know, after the governor's order has come through. And so anyone who is in our immigrant community who, you know, do the things that you need to do that are essential. Do not change the way you're do them, doing them. We, are, we, Montgomery County, are not changing the way that we look at immigration status. We do not consider it as a, as a limitation or barrier in any way to your ability or your necessity to access key services. And so um, that should not, um, we, we were very explicit with the officers, that should not be part of the equation. Uh, and they should, and our residents should feel confident that our law enforcement are going to continue to operate in the way that we expected to operate. And County Executive Elridge, can you also add upon that? Because I know this is a very big um, piece of um, your administration yes. and also in accessing services as well. So I just today, this at, late this afternoon, got a document from the state. I had asked them what support was going to be provided for undocumented families. We know that um, Probably the biggest hit is if you're not, don't have a social security number, the amazing unemployment benefits will not be coming to you. And so undocumented families with um, adults who are not working are going to take an enormous hit. And people are very concerned about the state services. I cannot list everything here, um, but we're going to have this up on our website tomorrow, but um, make it clear that um, Undocumented people can continue to access medical services and, and receive care for acute medical needs at hospital emergency departments. 
and that includes labor delivery services and dialysis, um, there will be no questions and there won't be any issues. Uh, supplemental nutrition program um, for women, infants, and children, the WIC program that some people know, any Maryland resident, including undocumented individuals who meets the WIC income requirements and is pregnant, new, or breastfeeding, or a new mo or breastfeeding mother, an infant or child under the age of five is eligible to receive food assistance. Um, generally, undocumented people and immigrants um, who received citizenship less than five years ago were ineligible for Medicaid, but the county continues to operate clinics and the clinics treat anybody again without asking questions. Um, we have, they have a Meals for Students program, people under the age of 18 and people with disabilities over 18 who participate in school programs, including undocumented people, are eligible for three free, three free meals a day. And there's website information, which will be on the site tomorrow. The uh, supplemental nutrition benefits are not eligible, are not available to undocumented persons. Um, health insurance, obviously, was, people were not covered under the uh, Obamacare Act, but that's why we have our health clinics. Um, so those services are available. Um, so what else is here? Emergency assistance for families with children, EAFC program, provides emergency cash assistance to families who need emergency help paying rent or utilities. The program does not have exclusions based on immigration status. The energy assistance program requires only one member of the household to be a U.S. citizen, so that can be a child. If the adults in the house aren't citizens, but the child is, they're eligible for the energy assistance program. Uh, there's a continuing, continuum of care network for people experiencing homelessness. And, um, and then there's the program that the county announced. We've, we are putting $5 million into a program that will provide the direct benefits to um, people in the community, doc documented or undocumented, and we're not gonna ask any questions about that. We're gonna make sure that people get assistance. And uh, I will say I had a conversation with the governor, which is partly what generated this letter, but I also have asked them to start looking at what they can do in terms of assistance for these families who fall out of all the traditional ways that we give assistance, such as unemployment. These, a lot of these folks, are, most of these folks, almost all these folks, are working every day, and if they've lost the job, you know they are paying rent with that money and buying food with that money, taking care of their kids with that money. It is a hole in our safety net, and we're working to try to fix it. Mr. Elmich, just a clarification on the meals that MCPS is supplying. If you are age two to 18 in this county, you can get those meals, three meals a day on the school days. If you are a student in Montgomery County Public Schools and you're 19 or 20, and that's every resident of Maryland can go to school until they turn 21 years of age, those meals are also available. And so I just wanna make sure that everyone who should be able to collect them can collect them and they know about it. I just add one other thing too. So in addition to the comments about uh, still having access to medical treatment, I wanna make sure that folks at home who may be undocumented, that they understand this. Do not let your immigration status influence your, cho your choice to seek medical treatment mm -hmm. to get tested for COVID-19. The medical community is open, and if you meet the criteria for testing, please come in, talk to a provider, get that service, and don't let that be a barrier or a perceived barrier to you seeking medical treatment and potentially getting tested. Thank you so much. I'm really proud to be part of a county who is here to protect and serve all of our residents. Um, so speaking of assistance, um, we recently announced um, the Public um, Health Emergency Grant Program. We've received numerous questions from business owners who want to know more about this grant, um, how it's going to help them, what are the guidelines for applying, when will the money be available, and how do they apply? So the short of it is the guidelines should be available next week, and shortly, as soon as we've got a common agreement on what those guidelines should be, then the program will get set up and people should be able to apply very quickly. Um, it is the intention of the program 
to tie into other programs. And, and this is, I'm glad you said, let me do this. Um, there are some amazing federal programs out there that go far beyond anything we're able to do with $20 million. And what our intention is for the $20 million is to be supplemental to the federal programs and state programs and to make sure that you know people who apply for county money are also have to apply to either the state or federal programs. Um, the state is standing these things up. They're taking the federal, I mean, the federal government is standing this up. They're taking applications starting tomorrow. I have to say, anybody who knows me, I have not been shy about criticizing the federal government from time to time. This bill is fairly amazing. And leaving aside whatever you know, corporate giveaways people are upset about, what it does for many, many Americans is absolutely astounding. So I got stopped when I was walking the other day. I maintained a safe talking distance by an Uber driver who was saying, you know, she's, you know, not driving anymore. She's got a mortgage payment, what she's supposed to do. And I said, well, you can get unemployment. She said, no, I can't get unemployment because I'm self-employed. This unemployment law changes means that if you are self-employed, if you're a 1099 employee, if you're a sole proprietor, if you're in the gig economy, if you're driving a, you know, an Uber, if you're doing deliveries, whatever you're doing for people, if you're not working, you're eligible for unemployment. You're eligible for unemployment on the day you became unemployed. There is no waiting period in the state of Maryland. And, and this is one of the best parts about this, unemployment benefits notoriously not very generous. The state average was $385 and the maximum unemployment benefit was $430. The federal government has added $600 a week, flat, not prorated, to the unemployment benefits. That would make the average payment $985, the maximum payment $1030. All they need is your social security number. Uh, you need to be patient because obviously with 9 million people, or whatever the astounding number of unemployed people is, uh, the phone lines might be busy. But it is there, it is real, and it is, should make a difference. It is enough money that people who are worried about where they're going to be able to pay their rent or make a mortgage payment, $900,000 a month, is four a week, is $4,000 a month. This changes a lot of people's you know, notions and people think that is, it is just that meager previous benefit and that they weren't eligible. Actually, the world has radically changed. And the same thing for the business community. If instead of closing, if you keep your doors open, when you don't keep your doors open, if you keep your employees paid, if we closed your doors, your doors are closed. But if you continue to pay your employees, one of the SBA programs will cover your rent will cover your payments to your employees, cover them as in pay for them, and turn the loan into a grant as long as you maintain 75% of your employees on the payroll. So the government is basically gonna pay you to keep people on your payroll, and they're gonna pay the rent if you're not generating money to pay the rent and assistance for other bills that you normally have. You might have a loan payment. So, the, the benefits from this, again, it is on the county website. It is on the, uh, if, you th if you go to the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation, their website is thinkmoco.com, thinkmoco.com. Go to the site, hit the business links to these programs. You'll see the federal programs there and the state programs there. Please take advantage of them. It's a way to guarantee that you'll be able to keep your business running. I, I said in the beginning that one of the things that concerned me most is what happens after the virus ends. And if businesses are faced with th two or three months back rent, two or three months back bills, um, that's gonna be an enormous hit. If you keep people employed, the government is going to pay you to keep people employed. It's good for you, your folks won't be looking for work, They'll know that when the doors open up, they can come back in there. You'll know that your rent is paid and your bills are being taken care of. There's every reason in the world for people to take advantage of these programs. And if I sound a bit evangelistic about this, I am. Um, when I heard the briefing, I had to go and look at the programs for myself and go through them to see you know, what was really here. 
This is, it is real, it is available, it is going to, I think, make the difference between a, a recovery that takes forever and a recovery that can actually be a little bit quicker in, in coming to fruition. But people have to take advantage of it. And I know there's so much cynicism in, out there about how we had treated unemployed people before and what, what our previous small business programs have been. I know I've talked to small business people who said, don't give me another loan because if I have to try to open up with back rent and back bills and you're gonna add a loan payment to me, you're not really helping me. These can be truly grants and if they're grants, they really make a difference in how you can look at your business. So if you've closed already, I would encourage you to look at this and see whether you can see the benefit of bringing people back on payroll and being able to apply for the benefits that the federal government is providing. We'll have this, this information is up on our website. We're gonna do some infographics and some other things to get this out there for both individuals, for unemployment and for businesses because we want you to take advantage of this. We don't want people individually or as businesses facing rents they can't pay and bills they can't pay and all the bad things that will follow. So please go to thinkmoco.com or go to the state SBA site. All this information is there. Great, thank you. Um, and it's good to know that there's so much support out there for small businesses and also individuals as well. So um, we talked about the support for the small businesses. You also mentioned um, unemployment um, because we did receive a lot of questions about yep. that. Um, and another question that we've received a lot is, you know, um, about rent mortgages and lease payments, <clears throat> as you mentioned. Um, so, you know, it is, April 2nd today, um, so rent is due for a lot of folks and people have been very concerned about their rent, mortgage, and lease payments. Um, what assistance are we <coughs> providing them? What can they access and any other comments? So we're writing guidelines for the money that we, the um, $5 million that's available for individuals, another million dollars going to nonprofits, and we'll write guidelines for that. But I will go back to my comments about unemployment. The people who are worried are people who are unemployed. If you're not undocumented, because all this, you know, you have to, you'll have to use the other state programs and other county. But if you have a social security number and you're unemployed, the amount of these unemployment payments ought to relieve a lot of people's anxiety about rent and even about mortgage payments. Um, I think people are just assuming that it's the old world and for one brief moment this is a new world <laughs> and so then in this case we're in a better place than we were in the old world so i would encourage people if you're unemployed just get on the phone and get filed tell them the day you lost your job and you'll start getting benefits pretty soon and i will say to businesses you will not be dinged for unemployed people that's the other thing they've said that nobody's going to penalize you with higher um, unemployment insurance rates because um, people lost their jobs because everybody knows they didn't lose the jobs because you fired them because you wanted to they lost the jobs because of the virus and so this is going to be no harm no foul um, for those of you who understand basketball lingo uh, <laughs> I, I, I used to try to apply that rule liberally when I was playing basketball um, <laughs> but I'll just say, you know, so I would just tell people, you know, look to us for support, but really there's far more support out there. We will never be able to provide $1,000 a week to people, but if you're unemployed, it is out there. Take it. Great. Thank you, County Executive. Um, so, Dr. Gales, um, I'm, I want to pick up on a, a couple of comments that were made earlier about masks and gloves mm -hmm. because there are so many questions around this. Should people wear them or not? Um, should the county be requiring a mask when people go out? What type of mask should I be wearing? Um, and are um, home-produced masks acceptable as well? Sure. So the question, the, the litany of questions you asked actually could be a, sex, a whole TV show in itself. Uh, so first and foremost, I again want to emphasize to folks at home is that we have been following uh, looking at other jurisdictions, looking at science, looking at data, looking at evidence to drive the information that we're putting out to you in terms of our recommendations and guidelines. 
Uh, when, it, when it comes to masks and gloves and those kinds of things, uh, we've looked at the information and we have been consistent in saying that the biggest utility for wearing masks comes from those who are symptomatic. And so wearing a mask of some sort would prevent you from coughing on things. So the droplets that would come from you coughing and expressing into the world would be blocked by that. So we've been consistent in that message from early on. Now the question has come up, is there utility if you are asymptomatic? Because we know that for a small percentage, there is the possibility that you can be asymptomatic and transmit to others. But is there utility if you don't have any symptoms and can that protect you from, from coming into contact with things? The, the jury is out. Um, however, I know that the CDC has been looking at that and as it's rumored that there will be guidance coming out from the federal level tomorrow. Um, what we can say is that we have been open to ideas and haven't said you can't wear masks or can't wear gloves. We just want to make sure that when people do make those choices, whether it's a strong recommendation or their own, uh, own choice, is that they're doing it properly. So that when you're wearing masks, for example, there are a certain category of masks that we prioritize for healthcare workers because they, based upon their level of exposure, the closeness of contact they have with patients, um, the closeness you know, in terms of the types of procedures that they do, there's a specific grade of masks that we need to have for them so that they can have for adequate protection. Those masks are called N95 masks or surgical masks with face shields. And when we're talking about that terminology, it means it's a higher level of protection that the mask provides in terms of screening materials coming in uh, and going out. Now, there has been a discussion about the cloth mask um, in terms of folks just walking around in general public. Um, again, the evidence is inconclusive one way or the other. Uh, but there is some thought that it can provide some utility for those when you're out in public. I will say this, and not shifting from the topic, but what really remains are the biggest things that will drive protection are our social distancing policies, our hand washing, cleaning surfaces, decreasing and limiting your exposure to other individuals. Um, so I say all of that to say that masks and gloves are a piece and a part of a larger toolbox of preventative measures that we're recommending to folks. And hopefully as things move forward, we will have clearer data. Um, but at this point, we say if you're wearing it, wear it safely, um, because we don't want folks to borrow Dr. Stoddard's term from earlier, we don't fo want folks to have a false sense of security that just because they have something on, they can still do whatever they want, congregate, be around folks for extended periods of time because they may have a, an increased sense of protection. I'll, I'll just ditto that. I mean, I, I'm obviously an advocate of wearing masks, but I, I wanna be clear that if you're wearing a homemade mask, which could keep you from spewing particles out, that is not a reason to think now you can, you know, put your arm around your buddies walking down the street and have that conversation other than six feet away because it is not 100% effective and much less so if it's homemade um, in terms of preventing you from acquiring virus particles. Distance is your friend and it, it, it will negate some of the lack of effectiveness of the mask if you're farther away from people and aren't in subject to exposure to the viral germ. So if you're gonna go out with cloth masks, I encourage it because you don't know if you're symptomatic sometimes, and it I think it will limit spread, but it will not make you invulnerable and let you do things that otherwise you shouldn't be doing. So wear a mask, keep a distance. So speaking of things, um, speaking of doing things that you shouldn't be doing, um, and, and we've seen this, the weather is getting warmer, uh, the cherry blossoms are out, um, and people are going to the park or in the backyard, um, People have seen social gatherings of 10 or more. So what is the county doing to stop people who are not practicing appropriate <clears throat> social distancing and breaking the no more than 10 person rule? And what do I do when I see a group gathering? So I've told people to break up and they have to. And the police will tell you to break up, but the police will only give so many warnings and if they find you again and again violating it, the penalty 
I think it's a, th is it up five, to $5, up to $5,000 and a year in prison. The governor has instructed the state police to enforce. The governor wants us to enforce because this goes back to what I said in the beginning. He's irritated because this, the spread of this is our doing and not following social distancing and not taking the advice that people gave us. Our behaviors have aggravated the spread of this disease. He's trying to manage something where we know many people are gonna die. And so when people just blithely disregard this and think that you know they can just go about life as it was before, it is, it is really problematic. And he's gotta think and I've gotta think about the people who are trying to do the right thing and they may get inadvertently exposed to people who, who in the biggest threat of all being the people who have it and aren't symptomatic. You don't even know that the person you think is perfectly fine could be symptomatic, could be infected. So if people persist, they will get tickets. It will not be the warning, it will be the ticket. So please don't test the police. Don't see how many times somebody can tell you or will tell you to go away. They're only gonna tell you a couple of times and after that, there are gonna be consequences. I'll, I'll also add, we've, we've seen for uh, parks, they have begun to remove basketball hoops. They have fenced off tennis courts. They have fenced, they're fencing off playgrounds. They're preventing non-sustenance related fishing in our lakes. Um, and so you're going to see increasingly aggressive actions. Uh, Dr. Gales and I were before County Council earlier this week and the question was asked, when is our peak going to be? And there's all this conversation about flattening the curve. And so if the question is, when is our peak going to be, the person who's gonna provide that answer is you. The people watching this, the people in our communities, the people who are out, who are out there decide, you know, interacting or not interacting, that your choices every day decide when our peak is. You decide when we see hospital surge. You decide uh, when we run out of PPE. You decide there's a lot of things that we control in, 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 our, in our community about the way this particular virus will spread. The virus requires human contact to spread. If we limit our contact, we will limit the ability of the virus to spread and we will kill it. But if we do not do those things, it will be much worse and frankly, more people will get sick and more people will potentially die. So Dr. Starter, um, not just for gatherings of 10 or more, right? Mm -hmm. So I have a, I grew up in this area. I have a lot of family in this area. I have a lot of friends in this area. Many of us are home teleworking. Is it safe for me to go visit my family or friends who have been in self quarantine for a week or two? Can I go bring them groceries? So, I mean, I certainly think Dr. Yales can chime in on this too. Um, it's all about the nature of your interactions. The more you can limit the interactions, the better off we'll be. I have family, I have, I have parents who are over the age of 70. I am not visiting them right now and I will not visit them for any, you know, at any point during this event until it's over. And that, and, and that is largely not because I don't love my parents, it's because I love my parents enough not to want to expose them and make them sick. Um, I have young children, I'm treating it the same way. They're not getting to see their grandparents right now for that very reason. Um, I want my parents to be around after this event is over for my grandchildren to enjoy them. And I don't want to be the reason why they get sick or, or worse. And so um, that is true of our friends, that is true of, of people that we work with. Uh, use, the, use the technology that we have in many cases to interact. It is, you know, I agree, mis mislabeled as social distancing, it's physical distancing. We can still have relationships with our family and our friends remotely and distantly. Uh, this, this will end sooner if we do those things more aggressively and we can get back to doing a, no a nor normal life and enjoying our families. Uh, but we have to act aggressively now to try and stop the spread of this virus so that we can do those things soon. Great, Dr. Gales, Sorry. do you want to add anything there? Sure, so I think the biggest thing is we want people to maintain as much of a semblance of their daily lives as possible. Obviously recognizing it's a little tricky given we're asking people to shelter in space. 
but you can continue to reach out and connect with your families. Uh, my parents are probably glad, well, in some ways glad this happened because I'm calling them every day asking, what'd you do today? Where'd you go? Who'd you talk to? How long <laughs> were you outside? I need to get my daily report. Uh, but, you know, we've talked about developing strategies. So for them, thinking from on a weekly basis, when you need to go out and get groceries, should you ask for pickup service when you get there, making a list of everything you need to get so you're going out one time and limiting your exposures. And even in the instance of potentially bringing groceries to other people, you can still do things like that, but again, practicing distancing. So dropping off the groceries at the doorstep and having some distance and saying hello and making sure everyone's washing your hands. So you, can, you still can connect to people in meaningful ways just maybe not as closely and intimately physically, uh, but those connections can remain intact while practicing social distancing and hand hygiene and those types of principles. Great, thank you both so much. So um, Dr. Um, Smith, um, one, <laughs> we've received a lot of questions and I'm sure you have as well uh, about um, grading, yes. graduation, proms and spring break. How is MCPS addressing all of these things? Absolutely. Uh, those are all uh, big questions for students and families always. And so we'll start with spring vacation. Uh, you know, when uh, Dr. Salmon said you need to plan to use spring vacation as makeup days, everybody had in mind the picture of a snowstorm and you just add days. Well, we don't know how that's actually going to work out. And once the the governor made his announcement and the increased uh, restrictions on movement and the increased uh, uh, requirements around social distancing, we came back and said, we're going to use uh, April 6, 7, and 8, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of this week as instructional days. Those will be learning days for our students. Uh, we will uh, stop school after Wednesday. Uh, one, there are two big religious holidays that happen at the end of next week. One of them starts at sundown on Wednesday night and you know they go through the weekend and so we'll have Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday when we'll leave families to celebrate those holidays or not as they choose, but we won't have learning days. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday uh, of next week, learning days. And then we'll pick up again on Tuesday, the 14th of April with learning days. So that's how spring break will work. As I said earlier, third marking period will end uh, that week of April 13th. That started that Tuesday, April 14th, 15th. That's the end of third marking period. I do want to point out that about 75% of the school year was accomplished before this happened. I saw a photo essay that said the lost school year. And if I hadn't had 10 million other things, I would have called that blog and said, don't say that. 75% of this school year was accomplished just the way it was intended. And we may get to go back this year, we just don't know. So fourth marking period, we're going to have in place uh, a, a different grading system. Uh, I know Prince George has already announced they're gonna go pass fail. We may do that, we may go with a, a, cho a choice for students. We're looking at all those things and working with the state of Maryland, uh, Maryland State Department of Education around that right now. But we, what, whatever we do with that fourth marking period grade, we're going to err on the side of the student. That's the principle that we're working on and talking about. And we'll make sure our families know how that's going to, uh, those grades are going to be uh, gathered and, and how they will be recorded as part of the student's record uh, by the end of next week or the very beginning of that last week of third marking period. And so that grading is a big deal. When we talk about proms, I don't know. As I said earlier, this closure is scheduled to end on April 24th. Students would be come back into school April 27th. People say, well, there's no way that's going to happen, and it may well not. What I would point out to everyone is four weeks ago tonight, I was in a hearing talking about the capital budget. And I came out and I had frantic voicemails from the state superintendent saying, it was just announced that the first three cases of this are in Montgomery County, and we were on the phone with Dr. Gales within a half hour. And we were all sitting in my office, you know, trying to figure out what happens next. A week later, schools were closed for two weeks. A week and after that, so I'm not quick to say I know what's going to happen. What I do know is going to happen is we're gonna err on the side of students around grading. We're gonna keep building out through phases our our digital online and paper 
experiences for students for as long as we need to. When it comes to celebratory activities, we, we're going to continue to plan to have graduations. If we can't have them in the traditional way, we're going to find a way for families within the protocols, within all the guidance, to celebrate with their school community the graduation of their student. We don't know what that will look like yet, but we're going to find a way. We're not going to have this just be nothing. And for those states who've already announced closure for the rest of the year, I absolutely am confident that if they are able to have large gatherings, they will have graduation whether their schools are in session or not. So proms, graduation, we'll all just stay tuned for what the next direction is from the state government about the continued closure of schools or not. And we'll plan for two things, to give the best learning experiences we can give for our students while simultaneously hoping that we can reopen schools this year and planning if we're not able to, what can we do? We're gonna focus on what can we do to make it as good as it can be for our students for the rest of this year. Great, um, thank you. So um, one more question about the schools. How are students who are English as a psycho second language learners or have learning plans being supported? Absolutely, uh, you know, of course, the students who receive English language services, the students who receive special education services, other sorts of services if they're not reading on grade level, students who receive accelerated services, so they're moving uh, faster and farther than their students. All of those are taken into consideration and part of how we're building out our plan. And we know that the school building staff is the most capable of knowing their students. They've been connecting with every student this week. And we're going to look at all the staff we have available to us in the system and in each school building. And we're talking right now, working right now on how to uh, build out those learning plans and really use a case management kind of approach for all of our students as this goes forward. Great, thank you. Um, Connie Executive Elrich, a number of people in the Asian community have reached out to our office and have raised concerns about discrimination and bigotry from the very beginning of this crisis unfolding. What do you have to say to them and the residents of this county? Um, we're not gonna tolerate racism, bigotry um, against anybody, um, period. Um, in targeting the Asian population for a disease that just happened to pop up in Asia it would be like trying to hunt down the, uh, the origins of any other disease and decide you're going to blame some people for something that's, you know, a virus which isn't even a living being, oddly enough. Um, so I just, you know, I find it offensive. It's not the way we do things in Montgomery County. We will prosecute hate crimes. We will and do everything we need to do to discourage that kind of behavior. I will say that the police have said this has not been an issue so far. That doesn't mean it's not happening because we know a lot of times people are uncomfortable reporting things and some communities are more uncomfortable reporting things than others. But um, we're not going to tolerate it and nobody should assume that anything about the virus or anything else is going to change the principles we have here. Great. Thank you so much for that reassurance. Um, so the last question um, that I have, and we've been inundated with um, these questions, and I'm thankful again for being in a county where so many people want to get involved. How do people get involved um, if they want to volunteer or if they want to make a donation? So I'll start with that. So uh, on our COVID website, there's actually a, a, a link that goes to our volunteer center that is both, it's a clearinghouse essentially for offers of support and requests of support. It, is, it provides information about opportunities to volunteer and or donate to not just Montgomery County, but also to the nonprofits who we closely work with. And so people who are interested in volunteering, and, and I wanna make this really important, you can volunteer from your home. There are opportunities to do tutoring, mentoring, using Zoom or other technology services out there. And so there are opportunities that have been identified. There are needs in our community for those kinds of things. And, you know, we've already seen a huge outpouring of support for, for you know, offering PPE, offering other donations, offering cash support. Um, and we are directing those to the service delivery mechanisms that exist within Montgomery County largely. And so all of those can be accessed through, accessed through our COVID website in partnership with um, what we call emergency support uh, function 16 
Volunteer and Donations Management is a partnership between Emergency Management, Health, the Office of Community Partnerships, uh, our, our nonprofit community, our faith community. We, we have a really great group that comes together, that partners together to make sure that we receive those donations, those volunteering opportunities, and they're directed into the service delivery mechanisms that exist within the community already. Can I add to that? Of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a time of year often when lots of our nonprofit groups have fundraisers. And there are some nonprofit groups that raise a substantial amount of their resources out of these spring fundraisers, and they're not having them this year. Pretty much everything has been canceled, and I expect that to continue. Um, they're hard to reschedule because if you schedule a venue, you know, somebody else might have a date that you want three or four months from now. So their opportunities to raise money through their traditional means are not going to be available. So if you give to any of these groups to deal with the homeless that help you know, people with feeding programs who help with housing programs. And you would have gone to an event and written a large check to help these organizations. Write the check anyway. They're not gonna be able to feed you. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes not so much. <laughs> um, but, you know, you're not gonna get the food, but the whole reason everybody goes to these events is to make a contribution to help the nonprofits to serve the people in our community. And so I'd ask people, if that's what you were gonna do, or if that's what you wanna do now, find the organizations you wanna to give to, and you can go to the COVID-19 site and find our organizations and, and give to them. Write the check you would have written for a dinner, write it because you wanna make sure these organizations can continue to function, which is the whole reason you're going to the dinner anyway. So if you can help, please keep helping. Uh, Dr. Gales, did you want to say something quickly before we wrap up? Sure. One topic we didn't cover is the work we're doing to create surge capacity within our hospitals and healthcare facilities. So we've, we're trying to ramp up testing, we're trying to ramp up outreach, but we're also working with our hospital partners and health system partners to create increased capacity should the cases continue to increase and we have more people utilizing hospital resources. And so to that end, as we look at options to create more space within our hospitals, and look at other sites to provide critical care in the future, we're going to need more staff support with that. And so I'm sending a, a plug out to our healthcare providers at home who are watching, who have an interest in helping volunteer and provide those services. Please let us know. Uh, we'll be happy to be in touch with you and provide you with more details as the need continues to arise. Thank you. Great, um, thank you all for answering those questions. Um, and I appreciate, again, your leadership um, and remarks. So County Executive Elridge, is there anything else that you wanna say to the folks at home? So I wanna reassure people that, that we are working together from the state um, down to the county, down to the smaller jurisdictions in the county. Um, it is a good thing to say that everybody is on the same team and playing from the same playbook and we're gonna to continue uh, to work together. Uh, one of the things that uh, has you know, informed my thinking is you know, I've directed our folks who are buying supplies um, to buy ahead because we know when this, when this passes, it's very likely that we will get a second wave and until we've got um, both treatments and um, vaccines, We've got, to prepared for, we've got to be prepared for the untreated and unvaccinated world. And so we're gonna make sure that the county gets the supplies that we're able to provide the backup um, so that you know, we're not having to build up supplies in the middle of this. Uh, we will be well prepared. And that's, you know, that's a lesson for everybody is that you know, we've seen what this can do now. We need to make sure that we bring those resources to bear. We are redoing the budget a little bit um, this is, as I said before, this is not the end of the world. The universe continues and we have a job to do. Um, so we're going to be making changes to the budget that will reflect what we think are the new physical realities, uh, which probably means that we're going to be making some cuts in some things. Um, but we're trying to minimize the damage because when, you're gonna, when this is over, you're going to expect the county to be there to serve you and we're going to continue to serve you. And we don't want to sacrifice things 
that people value. Uh, I want to thank everybody on this panel um, for being part of this discussion. And I want to thank people at home who are tuning in and listening to this and the folks who will be seeing it um, as we rebroadcast. Uh, thank you for paying attention. If you heard something that's interesting, um, please get the word out. If you've got friends who are unemployed particularly, remind them that there's help and, they, and let them know where they can help find that help. Um, there are four websites I want to give you. MontgomeryCountyMD.gov, that's the county website. MontgomerySchoolsMD.org, that's the school system's website. You can call MC311 Monday through Friday from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. There's a restaurant guide for where you can pick up food, mocoeats.com, and the Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation that has that amazing collection of business information is thinkmoco.com. So again, there's help. We're here to help you um, take advantage of the resources, and we're actually going to be back soon. This is just the first. It's not the last. Thank you. Yes, so we urge all of our folks at home to stay connected with us on Facebook, Twitter, and the county website. Uh, we will be hosting more of these, as the county executive mentioned. Thank you for tuning in with us today. Um, thank you, and talk to you soon.